Hello, we have finally made it to what I hope is the last part of this week's comic book review video, the DC books, and we are starting off this video with the Omega Men issue number six. Um, in the last issue, we saw the Omega Men retrieve the Alpha Key, but um, it cost them, well, one, one of their members have died and then the rest were captured. Um, and we begin this issue with the captured Omega Men being, you know, captured and interrogated and interro tortured by their captors. And um, as they are interrogated, um, they are all asked one question, and that is why does why do the Omega Men need Kyle Rayner? And we see how the interrogator knows each of these members of the Omega Men, you know, what they were before they joined this terrorist organization. And then, of course, the Omega Men have orchestrated a rescue led by Scraps, who takes their ship and just crashes it into the prison ship in what is a pretty spectacular rescue. And then, as, you know, as Scraps and Doc, and Doc is the sarcastic robot who is pretty great who I'm taking quite a shine to and as they lead this rescue uh, we find out how all the Omega Men kind of were recruited um, who is the real leader of this organization and during the chaos uh, Kyle Rayner escapes and um, as the prison is falling down the Omega Men have to retrieve Kyle before they crash onto the planet that they are orbiting at the moment. Um, so yeah, action-packed issue. We find out a lot of backstory. Um, we find out more about the organization of the Omega Men, um, how all these characters know each other, how they met, you know, who, who is the real leader, who's orchestrating all of this. Um, and it's all kind of during a prison break where the prison is falling onto a planet, so you definitely have stakes there. Um, just really entertaining issue. Uh, one of my uh, favorite parts was Doc, the sarcastic robot, who um, who really just has a good quip, a good response to everything, a good retort to um, everything happening in the book. Um, I mean, I it's you know it's kind of a you know it, it's not an original character exactly. Um, it's kind of like uh, HK-47 from, what was that, Coder? Um, but, yeah, it's, or like Bender. He's kind of like Bender from Futurama. I think that's a more well-known example of the sarcastic robot. Um, but yeah, pretty fun character. I like the action. I mean, that one panel I showed you of the ship crashing into the other one, that's just brilliant. Um, that's a fun image. And, uh... So yeah, I'm quite enjoying Omega Men. Uh, I still haven't found the first three issues, I think it was, that I missed, but um, I think I'm catching up with the story pretty well, and I'm enjoying it, and liking a lot of the characters, uh, so that is that for that. Next up is Wonder Woman, issue 46. And this was a little disappointing, to be honest, because I really liked this issue up until the very end. So at the end of the last issue, we find out that the main villain of this arc is, um, is Iana. The Iana? It's E-I-N-E-A, uh, e E-N-A, I think. Um, oh, it's Irene. Yeah. E-I-R-E-N-E. -E. Irene, Irene. I'm not sure. The goddess of peace. We find out that she's the one who has been orchestrating um, all of the bad things that have been going on. She recruited Argeus to kill um, to kill Diana. And we find out that her motivation is, I mean, if you think about it for two steps, is that Diana refuses to be a goddess of war, you know? Um, which renders the god of peace kind of useless. Like, if there's no war, then, you know, why is there a goddess of peace? And so... Her whole plan was to drive Diana to 
start a war, to be violent, to let, you know, let her anger go and consume her and all that. Which is a pretty interesting take. I think that's actually pretty clever, is, you know, making the, the goddess of peace want the god of war to actually be a god of war. So, you know, she is necessary. Um, and uh, Zeke eventually pops in, and um, he's part of the part of the ending that I don't like, that I feel is a deus ex machina. Um, but through this issue, in order to convince Diana to start a war, um, the goddess of peace shows Diana what a world without war is like, and tries to tell Diana that war is not just, you know, tanks and soldiers and guns, uh, that the god of war is responsible for stuff like righteous uh, rebellion and um, giving people a fighting spirit to um, to fight for themselves and topple um, oppressive power and all of that. And I wasn't liking that at first. I was like, no, that's, you know, like, that's not what war is. But what I like about this book is that Diana agrees. Like, Diana's like, no, that's bullshit. You know, you can have rebellion. You can have you know, changing power, you can have the, the fighting of oppression without war, you can have nonviolent protest, you can have, you know, other sorts of rebellion without it being a full-on war, without it killing innocent people and all that. And I love that. Um, I love that even though she's the god of war, Diana refuses to, to hurt people, you know? She wants to protect people, to save people. That she doesn't want to be a god of war if it means you know, causing wars, um, which is something that the goddess of peace is very much against, because again, like, her whole point is, without war, there can be no peace, and if the god of war is going to be the god of peace, you know, what's the point? And a lot of this book, like, the first, you know, 80% of this book goes in a very interesting direction with that, and eventually you do get a bit of a fight as the god of peace, as, um, I Irina, um, kind of, you know, keeps on goading Wonder Woman on. We do get Wonder Woman punching her out. And, but I, I, I really like the direction this is going for this part, where, you know, it's her trying to, like, convince Diana to, to you know, let out the war, even though the goddess of peace is, you know, she seems to want more, you know, want war a lot more than Diana does, and you think, oh, maybe they're going to switch places, and she's going to be the new god of war, and Diana's going to be the new god of peace. But then instead, a whole lot of bullshit happens with Zeke, um, who is, of course, the, um, a lot of, yeah, just a lot of bullshit happens with Zeke, who is the reincarnation of Zeus, and it turns out it was all part of Zeus's plan to make the gods immortal again, um, and Don, and he also revives Donna Troy, and all that, and it's just, it, it's like the last four pages of this book that everything gets solved, and it's solved because Zeus had a plan for it all along. It, it literally is, you know, considering this is like all Greek gods and all that, it literally is a deus ex machina. I mean, not literally, because it's not a play and it's not a robot contraption that puts a statue of a god on the stage. But it's, you know, the, 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 it was made because in ancient Greek theater, There'd be parts where at the ending there would just be a, a, a statue of a godly lord on stage and it would be like, oh, Zeus or Athena or one of the gods just kind of fixes everything and resolves the plot. And that's exactly what this is. It's Zeke, the, you know, Zeus, coming onto the scene and be like, oh, I fixed this. I planned for this all along. It's all fixed now. Um, everything is better. And it's not fulfilling. It feels cheap, and especially where it looked like they were going with this story, where they actually had a real conflict between war and peace, and seeing how that could resolve itself either with war or with peace, you know? And how the goddess of war wanted peace, and the goddess of peace wanted war and all that. Like, I thought that was incredibly interesting. And then to just hand wave it by saying, oh, there's no more, you know, fight anymore, there's no more conflict... It was just a misunderstanding, and Zeus solved all of it years ago as part of his plan. It's bullshit. It really is. It ruins this book. Like, I really like this book. I like the art. I like the conflict that they were building. I liked how they were exploring what a god of war could be, even though I kind of disagreed with it. Um, like, that was interesting conjecture. And then they just ruined the last four pages by making everything better, and uh, I can only snap with my right hand. But, yeah, it's... It really does suck, because this book could have been so much better. 
And I feel maybe it's, again, like this is, I think, the sixth issue of this arc. Maybe they just wanted to finish it up, which I get. But, I mean, I, I could have said, if they were to stretch out into two issues and give this an ending that actually fit, that actually felt fulfilling and wasn't just, oh, the baby solved everything, then I would have liked this a lot more. It had so much potential, and I really feel like they squandered it. Um, but... I mean, it was still good enough where I want to keep reading. That's also, like, the weird thing. is like, despite the bad ending, I liked enough of this book where I want to see what else they do with this character and with this world and all of that. Um, it's kind of frustrating, but, I, like, I'm going to keep reading. I did enjoy it that much, so, um, you know, take that as you will. Next up, a book I can say I wholeheartedly enjoyed, Superman, Lois, and Clark, issue number two. Um... Yeah, this book is just, it's right up my alley. It is post-Crisis Superman in the New 52 world showing the New 52 what Superman is supposed to be, you know? And I feel a little spoiled for really good Superman stuff, considering we also have um, American Alien running, or uh, Superman American Alien, which has started, which is, again, like a story that's written by someone who I feel really understands the Superman character. And so now we have, you know, like an actual proper Superman story with an actual proper Superman from before the New 52 that I really enjoy. And besides just, you know, being Superman, we also have a really good Lois in this story. And uh, we begin this book, and most of this book, actually, is from Lois's point of view. It's seeing how Lois is adjusting to her new life. Um to being, you know, off the grid, to hiding, getting new identities, raising a son, um, and, and seeing all that. And I love this per first page, because we see Lois talking to John, and she's discussing how she used to be, you know, a Pulitzer-winning journalist, and she could have an interview with anybody she wanted, and, you know, she was this really powerful journalist, and, you know, very well respected and all that. And now she's kind of stuck in this small little town under false identity, writing for the small town newspaper, you know? And how she's dealing with that struggle of, um, of having to, like, just shrink her life down so much. Also, I like how, the, I just noticed the mailbox here is, um, 1938, which is the year that Superman debuted, so that's kind of cool. Um... And then meanwhile, while Lois is adjusting to her new life, we also see Clark, who's doing some under-the-radar supermaning and doing it so much better than the Superman of, um, of the New 52 does, where he stops an earthquake. Like, this, is, this panel is Superman stopping an earthquake from under Chicago and then going after the guy who, who's causing the earthquake, the villain causing the earthquake, and dispatching him within one page you know, safely, and not punching, you know, like, not injuring the guy too hard, just taking away his power suit and leaving him for the authorities. <clears throat> just a one-two punch, you know, how Superman should take care of people, you know? And then being chased by the government, who he's still trying to hide from because there's already a Superman on this world, and he doesn't want to interfere unless he really needs to. Um, yeah, it's, it's really, it's just what what Superman should be. Um, the rest of this book concerns the government getting on Clark's trail as they discover what happened to um, to the Excalibur uh, that Clark rescued in the last issue. Um, we uh, find out what um, you know what sort of person that Jonathan is, the Superman's son, as we see Jonathan kind of being a bit of a troublemaker in school and having to have Lois get called in to, um, you know, to, to talk to the principal about his uh, disruptive behavior. And then we have the very end of this book is the government, or um, I think they say it's intergang later on in the book, but intergang ambushing Lois and Jonathan and uh, Clark having to rescue them, um, of course, discreetly, because... You know, him just flying in and announcing himself would kind of ruin the whole point of staying undercover. And so we get one more Superman scene of him stealthily taking out everyone hunting Lois and his son. 
Yeah, this is a better Superman book than the mainline Superman stuff right now. I mean, as much as I've been enjoying action comics, it is a very different Superman story. If you're in the mood for just a, a you know, a very classic feeling Superman story with the classic feeling, you know, kind of Boy Scout Superman, then I would pick up Lois and Clark. I, again, we're only two issues in, but I've been enjoying this book so, so much, and I think that any fan of Superman would. Um, there's a lot to love here. Um, just seeing, you know, these characters as, you know, in their, in their kind of classic incarnations. And, um, again, I'm just having lots of fun with it as a Superman fan, and I think that any Superman fan would. Next up is Robin, Son of Batman, issue number six. Uh, this is the final issue of this arc. Um, and I really enjoyed it. I think it's a really good ending to the arc, if not a little kind of sugary sweet at the end. But we start with something completely adorable. Um, we find out how Damien met Goliath. Um, and it was during the Year of Blood. Damien genocided Goliath's like parents and people and all that. And then right before, you know, completely killing off their kind, we see little little baby Goliath. And this is just adorable. I think we see little baby Goliath and Damien wants to fight him and you know, he's still this is still your blood Damien, it's a flashback, but then you know, Damien oh, this is just so cute. We just see Goliath, like, lick Damien, and Damien has to drop his sword. He can't do it. He's, you know, even before being adopted by Bruce Wayne, Damien's still not evil, you know? And it's just cute. It's just really, really cute, and I like it. Um, and I'm not going to apologize for liking something really cute, um, because it's... Just, just look! It's just a little, little lick in the nose and all. I can't. I can't. It's too good. It's too adorable. Um... Yeah, so then flashing forward to the present, and we see Talia al Ghul um, march into this town of Balia, <laughs> Talia and Balia, and declare herself a new queen, which kind of goes uncontested after she knocks the teeth out of the current king um, of Balia. The family's still being hunted by the... Um, by the whoever was last issue, I forget his name. Uh, it's in here somewhere, by Dendarga, but they are safe in Balia for now. Um, and Talia basically, at this point, just asks Damien for forgiveness. Um, he says that, you know, T Talia tells Damien that um, she's changed, that all the evil bit is in this little pearl, and uh, Damien could either forgive her or seek his, uh, um, what is it, forgive or... Uh, seek retribution. Um, so either forgive Talia and join her, or kill Dahlia, um, basically. And that's the choice that he gives her. Before he makes his decision, Damien asks where nobody went, and it turns out that she went to Gotham. And, um, yeah. So then Damien goes to Gotham, finds nobody, and nobody tells Damien what she thinks of her, and we have another pretty sweet moment here, <clears throat> where um, it looks like it's a kiss, but it's actually like a brother-sister thing. It's not like a romantic thing at all, which is nice, because I'm, I'm glad they're not turning this into just a romantic thing when I think it's, it's better as like a brother-sister relationship anyway. And then we find out, kind of, again, it's like an ending. Um, I don't want to spoil the entirety of the thing, uh, just the first half, it turns out, but... Yeah, besides that, it gets pretty sickly sweet as we find out um, what Damien decides to do with Talia, and then what his next steps are going to be after that. Um, yeah, um, so I felt around issue 3, 4, this book was starting to get a little repetitive. Issue 5, did a, I think, did a great job of shaking things up. And I think this issue does a really good job of completing this first arc. Um, it's, again, it's a bit, like, if I had any complaints, it's that it's a little too clean of a conclusion. Um, like, 
it, it it doesn't leave enough really to they, like the actual like last pages are very kind of open ended and saying so you know it's basically and then join our hero next week for a brand new adventure sort of dealio, um, but it's sweet. We get some really sweet moments between uh, Damien and nobody and Damien and Goliath like this in the beginning that really cute thing, um, and then we yeah we have to find out where Damien goes after this and I'm really excited for that. Um, so yeah, where I did have my kind of off moments with this book, um, I felt the last two issues did a good job of kind of uh, saving face and mixing enough things up, and uh, just showing how kind of the the total breadth of what this book can be, and so I'm excited for it, and um, I think we're going to pick up the next issue, uh, which is The Robin War, which I'm kind of excited to, uh, to find out and see what happens there as uh, Damien returns to Gotham and everything, blah, 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 blah. So, yeah, Robin kind of kind of went off track and rambling with that, but I enjoyed the issue is the bottom line there. Hmm. And I'm thinking we have three books left this week. We're already 20 minutes into this video. Hmm. Yeah, let's just move on to Grayson, number 13. Um... As we dig deeper and deeper into the origin of Spiral, as Dick Grayson, you know, tries to find out who Agent Zero is, and what is Spiral's endgame. Um, which we actually kind of find out in this issue here. Um, which is pretty neat. So, while we have um, Dick Grayson, Agent uh, Tiger, I forget his agent number, but we have Dick Grayson, Tiger, and... Um, Lady Tron breaking into um, Spandau, the Spandau facility with all the information on, um, on Agent Zero and on Spiral, and they have to fight off all these Spiral spider security drone sort of things, which is pretty cool. Um, while that's happening, um, we also get some... Uh, this mysterious narration um, by the founder of Spiral, and we find out exactly who he is and why he founded Spiral and kind of what his whole deal is. Um, so yeah, I don't want to talk too much about this issue because it is very spoilery, um, as we find out basically everything about Spiral. It is the origin story of Spiral. And we find out at about the same pace that Dick Grayson does in this story. Um, so if you wanted some answers, this is the issue to get them. Um, I don't know how spoilery this page is. I'm kind of trying to cover the spoilery bit of the text with my finger here. Um, but yeah, um, this does relate back to a lot of earlier Batman stuff. Um, Stuff like uh, Grant Morrison's run on Batman, Batman Incorporated, that sort of thing. So if you read that um, and were kind of wondering where that all went after um, the Batman Incorporated book in the New 52, this kind of picks up those story threads a little. Um, and besides that, yeah, I can't really talk about much of this issue without dropping spoilers, which I really don't want to do because... Um, the ways it ties in, I feel, is really good, and uh, I, it, it just fits really well and all that. So, yeah, I, I kind of don't want to talk much about this issue. It is a lot of exposition. Um, I feel that the action bits with Grayson um, uh, fighting the spider robot things um, does do enough to break it up. Um, but it is very segmented. It's... Here's Dick Grayson fighting spiders, and then here's just narration, and here's Dick Grayson, and then here's narration. Um, so there is that, um, which is, it's very segmented storytelling. Um, but yeah, I like a lot of what happens in this book. I think it's really interesting. Um, and I wish I could talk more about it without dropping too many spoilers. But if you've been liking Grayson, which I have, um, I don't think you'll be disappointed in this issue. <clears throat> Next up, we have Batman Robin Eternal number 8, um, another sort of kind of simple issue to get through. Um, 
as Dick Grayson finally meets Mother, um, who offers to tell the truth between, you know, of what Dick Grayson is and what Bruce Wayne's business with her was. And while this is happening, we have um, Harper and Cass fighting off the mother-controlled ballet. Um, and so that's that's where we're at. And that's really all we get with the story. We get a little bit at the end with um, with Tim Drake and Jason Todd uh, investigating a church. But, um, yeah, with uh, Tim Drake and Jason Todd investigating a church. But besides that, uh, the majority of this book really is Dick Grayson's choice. Um, as Harper and Cass are fighting the the ballerinas and ballerinos, that is the male ballerina. Um, I don't know. I'm guessing ballerino. Um, so while Cass and Harper are fighting them off, Dick Grayson has to make a choice of whether to help them or to follow Mother and find out the truth behind what Bruce Wayne did with her and why she's so dangerous and all that. Um, it's an interesting choice. It's interesting stuff. Um, we also get a bit of flashback that hints us into, you know, what Bruce Wayne's business with her might have been. But for the most part, it's just that kind of dramatic question. Uh, the fight scene, again, is good, as the fight scenes in this book tend to have been. Here's uh, just one page I really enjoyed of uh, Cass beating up the prima ballerina. Um, and then getting conked on the head by somebody else. Um, which is kind of, you know, it's kind of disheartening to see Cass just conked on the head because she's been such a badass fighter so far. It doesn't seem like the sort of thing that would happen to her, but I mean, it's, it, it serves a point in the story and, you know, helps things chug along, so I can't fault it too much. But, you know, again, there's not much to this issue besides what I already said, and I don't want to get into too much detail of what happens because, again, spoilers. Um, but, yeah, pretty pretty interesting issue, I think. Um, you know, not very plot-heavy, but just enough, you know, questions asked to keep you interested in the story, I think, and the fight scene itself is good enough to um, to justify reading and enjoying the fight. So that is Batman Eternal. Again, weekly, not much to say week to week, but I hope, uh, I hope these reviews are worth something. And now I think the book that uh, most of us have been waiting for this week, I think, I'm pretty sure the book with the most press to come out this week in comic books, it is The Dark Knight 3, The Master Race, issue number one. Now, I have some nuanced feelings, I guess, about the original Dark Knight um, by, you know, Frank Miller and all that from 1985 or 1984, I forget exactly when. I respect The Dark Knight um, as a book. I think on its own, as a just a reinterpretation of the Batman character in the 80s, it's incredibly good. It's an important book, um, especially to get an understanding of the Batman character past 1985. Like, if you want to understand Batman up to that point, up to, like, the modern day, you have to, if not begin at the Dark Knight, you have to acknowledge the influence that that book had. And even going back today and reading, just, you know, the Dark Knight, those four issues, I think it's four issues, they are incredibly well done. Um... They're very self-contained, they tell a story really well. Frank Miller is an artist. Um, he is an artor. Um, you know, he, he, I mean, just visually, he has a very, uh, a very unique style. He, um, he, he has a good, he's a phenomenal storyteller. He was back in the 80s. Um, I enjoy his work on Daredevil, I enjoy The Dark Knight, as I said. Um, I enjoyed Batman Year One a whole lot. Um, I mean, I prefer Year One to Dark Knight, but you know, Dark Knight Two, um, T O O, not T W O, um, is also fantastic in its own right. It's an important book, and it's a very, very good Batman story. What I don't like is how it's kind of become bedrock for Batman. Like, you have a lot of stories. Um, 
that kind of use the Dark Knight as the bedrock for what a Batman story should be, you know? Instead of recognizing that it's it's an it's an Elseworld story. It's before Elseworlds, but it is a reimagining. It is a what if for Batman. You know, what if Batman was this, you know, was this thing? And I think that, like, the legacy of the Dark Knight has been ruined by things like the Dark Knight Strikes Back and the work that Miller has done kind of post-2001, um, where he did turn Batman into kind of a fascist, um, which I don't think Batman should be. Um, I think that was, it's less in the Dark Knight, and I think... If you read The Dark Knight, considering it, it was the 80s, it was largely a response to the overt campness of stuff like the Adam West Batman. And, I mean, it was also writ you know, written during stuff like Reagan and Thatcher and that sort of thing going on, where it was, by and large, I think a scarier time, a time where not, I, I don't want to say like fascism was more appealing, but the idea of an individual fighting against the government, you know, was... Like, the government, I think, was worse back in the 80s. You had, you know, a government that was um, breaking up labor unions and really seemed anti-poor and all that. You had a just a much more, I think, a world where that story fit a lot more than it did in 2001 um, and what happened with The Dark Knight Strikes Back and all that. The main thing I guess I want to say is I really like The Dark Knight. I don't like what Frank Miller has done kind of post-2001, post post-9-11 post sort of thing. But what I the, the reason I picked up this book um, is because ever since New York Comic Con this year, everything I've heard about The Dark Knight 3 has been distancing, has been kind of distancing itself from Frank Miller. Um, even at Comic Con, and I think, like, in every interview since Comic-Con, Frank Miller has said, this is Brian Azzarello's book. Um, it's my idea, but it's Brian Azzarello writing it. It's Brian Azzarello's story. I'm just, you know, I'm kind of a consultant, you know, less than the author of this story. And I really like Brian Azzarello. He has some of the same problems as Frank Miller, but he's more tempered, I think, by humor and by... I don't know, like, he, he understands what a story needs more so than what his own agenda is at times. Um, and he's definitely better at writing women, I feel, than Frank Miller, as evidenced by his fantastic run on Wonder Woman uh, in the New 52. And the reason I brought up woman like that um, is because this first issue is almost entirely female characters. Um... Again, I don't want to spoil too much, um, but we begin... Uh, I'll just get into the story now of this book. Um, oh, also one thing I did want to... I, I, I wanted to just point out, just this whole list right here, this is variant covers. This book has 54 variant covers. That is insane. Um, and I just wanted to point that out while, while I was on it. Um, yeah, that that's that's just nuts. Fifty-four variant covers. How how could you do that? But uh, yeah. Where are we? Yes. Um. Yeah. As the story begins, um, kind of like in Dark Knight Strikes Back, Batman has made his first appearance in three years after being completely absent from Gotham. Um, but this time when he reappears, he's beating up cops. Um, and so that is, that is what, where we are with Batman. Um, with Batman reappearing after three years, beating up cops, and then, of course, the reaction to that. Um, then we cut to, um, the Amazon, or Themyscira, I guess, as we see Wonder Woman who's reminiscing about Superman and hinting us that Superman disappeared. That um, Superman has been beaten, 
or something that made him turn his back on humanity. Um, but Wonder Woman won't give up. She's on Themyscira, but she's still protecting people. Um, the natives from this Minotaur guy. And she's also raising a new son, um, who's named Jonathan. Presumably uh, another of uh, Superman's children. <coughs> and while she's doing that, uh, her daughter with Superman, uh, Lara... Is it Lara or Lana? One minute. Um, yeah, Lara has flown to the Fortress of Solitude to talk to Superman um, and find out, you know, well, we find out where Superman has been um, and he is frozen in the Fortress of Solitude. And Lara is wondering, you know, why... Why did you let them bring you down? Um, in The Dark Knight Strikes Back, Lara was very, you know, you're Superman, you should rule these people, you should take control. Um, and I guess she still has a bit of that left in her, where she's wondering why. She says, why did you let these ants bring you down? Um, and then she stumbles across the bottle city of Kandor. And then we cut back to Gotham at the very end, where... Um, where, uh, Commissioner, what's her name? One, one minute. Uh, where the com where Commissioner Yindel has to deal with Batman beating up cops. Um, yeah, and so then we cut, you know, very end, back to Gotham with Yindel trying to deal with Batman and figuring out why, why is Batman returned? Why now? And why is... He doing what he's doing. So, I mean, I'm cautiously optimistic at this point. Um, oh, one more thing I should probably mention is that in this book, we also get a, a little bonus mini story. Uh, the Dark Knight Presents the Atom. Uh, despite the cover, has no Superman in it, uh, but in that we follow the Atom as he reminisces about his days being a superhero and wondering what is he going to do now you know is he going to try and fight what's he you know what monsters is he fighting now um and reminisces on bruce and their role in the justice league before being approached by lara um who's holding the bottle city of candor and i think it's pretty easy to put two and two together here given the Atom's power base and the bottle city of Kandor. Um, but yeah, as I said, I am cautiously optimistic. Um, I think you can tell just from the presence of three strong female characters in this book that if this is Frank Miller, it is a very changed Frank Miller, but it is probably more Brian Azzarello. Um, and, like, right now, again, we're one issue in. There hasn't been much of a focus on any single character at this point. But, um, just seeing Wonder Woman, seeing Lara, seeing, uh, Yindel, all... We, we get there... We don't get any, um, any narration from Batman. We just get narration from Wonder Woman, from Lara, and from Yindel. So we're getting into these women's heads, we're treating them as characters with motivations, with agency, and I mean that that's for the Dark Knight, that is wonderful. That is amazing. Um and so again that that is that makes me cautiously optimistic about the future of this story, where it's going, and the sort of story that we might get from it. But even if Frank Miller had nothing to do with this story at all, I feel like his impression is definitely there. That in the same spirit as something like Before Watchmen, this is Azzarello and Kubert doing Frank Miller. And probably doing Frank Miller than even Frank Miller could do himself at this point. Um, we get the, the, the... His use of... Uh, uh, Kubert's use of panel layout and uh, visual storytelling in this. Aside from just, you know, kind of a blocky style that is um, immediately reminiscent of Frank Miller, his 
actual pacing and uh, layouts of this book are like the best of Miller. Um, you know, it's it, it's a real homage to Miller, especially again playing with light and shadow and not so much contrast in this issue, but there are a few really good panels with contrast in this too. Um, I'm going to skip to the end and hopefully not spoil too much. Again, I, I feel like even even when he was doing terrible writing, um, I think Frank Miller's art is is pretty fantastic. It is at the very least um, recognizable. Like you can tell when Frank Miller is doing a thing, when something is influenced by Frank Miller, um, and like just his way of storytelling, his his way of visual storytelling, how he spaces panels, how he paces the uh, the action. This page in particular, I think, is just probably the best two-page spread in this book. Um, as you have Batman, who's being chased by the cops, use his gun, use his, uh, not gun, his uh, grappling hook, and repel up, and we get this. This panel here is just, I love this panel here, of just Batman after grappling up perching waiting for the cops and then jumping down in this panel with the light shining on him um and this actually this panel here strikes me very much as more of a batman year one thing which uh, wasn't illustrated by miller but i'm pretty sure um you know that that's again his story his his sort of storytelling um so even if miller is only a name on this book to sell copies I think the best parts of his influence can be felt in this book. Um, so yeah, I'm again cautiously optimistic for this book. I want it to be good. Um, I'm not, you know, no two bones about it. Uh, the Dark Knight Strikes Back is awful. It is not a good story. Um, but the Dark Knight is, um, and I'm hoping this is a lot more like that than than the Dark Knight Strikes Back. Um, and so far, I mean, again, I, I like this issue a lot. There's a lot to like, um, whether you like Frank Miller or not, I feel. Um, so that, that's where I am with, with The Dark Knight 3, issue number one. And that is finally it for this week's comic book reviews. Um, if you're interested in what I thought about the Marvel uh, books that came out this week or some of the independent stuff that came out this week, those are in the previous two videos, which are already up by now. Um, but if you, you know, whether or not you want to watch those or not, I want to thank you for watching this one, for making it all the way to the end of this incredibly long video. Um, if you like this video, please rate it. If you want to, please subscribe. Any comments, questions, thoughts, opinions, anything whatsoever. If you want to say I'm wrong about The Dark Knight and it's the most best fantastic Batman story ever and it's completely flawless, put that down below. We could have a, you know, spirited but hopefully civil debate. Um, and yeah, that's about that. Um, if you are in America, I want to wish you a happy Thanksgiving because that is, it's actually today at this point when, when I'm recording it, um, unless you're in California, in which case you're still like 40 minutes left. So happy Thanksgiving either way, if you're in America or if you're not, and we don't want to celebrate it anyway, happy holidays. Um, I'm of course thankful for all of you watching these videos, and I hope that you will join me again for some more comic book reviews.